I will t uh, tell you about some um, work uh, that uh, we've done in the past and present on optimal strategies in single cell sensing and, and response. Um, but uh, first, I'd like to put up this, um, this schematic that shows a possible hierarchy for understanding biological organization from the level, level of, of molecules, proteins, and genes to cells and um, organs and ultimately organisms. In this hierarchy, uh, networks of reacting and, and diffusing um, um, biomolecules, biochemical reaction networks, constitute the cellular hardware carrying out the processes of life from cell growth, death, to response to environmental cues. So uh, in the current post-genomic, post-proteomic era that, era that we live in, um, it has become increasingly possible to obtain com complete molecular parts lists for, um, for organisms. Um, like that shown here for an automobile, for example. And of course, the ultimate goal is to understand how an organism works from its, uh, its uh, building blocks, from its molecular parts, uh, while characterizing the molecular parts is, uh, is, um, is uh, carried out by molecular um, uh, biologists, figuring out how these parts go together, um, how, uh, uh, how individual molecular elements um, interact in space and time to confer functionality to a given signaling module and ultimately to a cell or organism is the, is, is, is the topic that, uh, that is uh, of interest to so-called systems biologists. So, the goal is, given a parts list, figure out how uh, the pieces go together uh, and, and what the function of the whole is. And not surprisingly, generating these parts lists has led to uh, uh, the formulation of diagrams such as, such as the one shown here. This one happens to characterize the early developmental stage in a model organism the sea urchin embryo, and uh, what, what it shows is linkages between uh, genes and, and proteins that are involved in regulating the early stages of that developmental process. And not surprisingly, these diagrams look uh, very much like integrated chip design, and uh, um, however, it's noteworthy that unlike their, their physical counterparts, uh, the various components um, in, in these diagrams are to varying degrees um, well characterized. Some are better characterized than others, and, and ultimately uh, understanding uh, really the quanti qu understanding quantitative, quantitatively the properties of, of the nodes in these, in these chip diagrams, um, and also uh, characterizing their, their linkage is, is, is something that's lacking, requiring um, um, combined um, efforts on the part of experimentalists and, 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 uh, and also theorists. So this was um, roughly the topic of an article that uh, appeared um, some years ago now um, written by a historian of science, um, speculating on whether um, uh, systems biology and, and its counterpart, synthetic biology, that aims to take what we learn from understanding biological systems to you know, build um, artificial viruses or cells that carry out um, certain uh, tasks that we're interested in, like engineering bacteria to make biofuels or make malaria medicine, et cetera, um, this, this author speculates as to whether these, these two emerging fields um, are as going to be as impactful as the molecular biology revolution in the mid-20th century, um, where 
a few combined effort of physicists, chemists, and biologists, um, the structure um, uh, of the DNA molecule and therefore um, its function as the genetic code of life was, was unraveled. Ultimately, he answers this question by saying no, that while impactful, these emerging areas are, 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 are not going to be as important as the, as, uh, as the uh, 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 molecular biology revolution in the previous century, but he notes that um, uh, nonetheless, these areas um, involve uh, a, a high degree of, of collaboration, interdisciplinary combined efforts by biologists, physicists, computer scientists, and engineers, should also say mathematicians. Um, um, and, um, but uh, interestingly, um, he points out that the role that, that physicists play in the molecular uh, uh, biology revolution um, is perhaps not uh, uh, due specifically to their, um, or, or, or due only to their scientific contribution to unraveling the structure of DNA, but rather in um, the, the, uh, the relationship that they introduce uh, between theory and experiment uh, in pursuing that problem the quest for simple principles that guide the functioning of organisms, and more important, their contribution to the, uh, th that, that, that these, these, these practices, the dialogue between experiment and, and theory, were in, in fact more important than, than um, the actual un unraveling of the macromolecular structure of DNA. So in that spirit, um, what I'm going to focus on uh, is, is a, uh, biochemical network that's much simpler than the one we saw in the, in the previous slide and has um, emerged as uh, perhaps uh, the hydrogen atom of signaling modules um, uh, where uh, uh, in, in this network that governs the response of, of individual bacterial cells to chemical cues in the environment, food or, or or, or uh, repellents, all the um, components are, are known, they're biochemically characterized, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of genetics is known about what happens when, when one of uh, the genes making uh, the, the, uh, a protein is, is knocked out, and, and as such, uh, it's, it's a simple, well-characterized well module that, um, that is amenable to in asking the sorts of questions that, that we're, we're interested in, 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 in learning about. Um, so this uh, chemotaxis network, uh, essentially as the name implies, uh, modulates the behavior of a bacterial cell in response to environmental cues and allows the cell to execute what's ultimately a biased random walk in favorable directions of increasing food concentration, for example, and um, away from harmful ones. And this, this is carried out. Um, uh, the starting point is the binding of a signal, a substrate molecule, to receptors on the surface of the cell, so-called um, biological sensors or particle detectors. This, this binding event triggers a cascade of, of reactions that are well known inside the cell, culminating in the change in concentration of an intracellular signal, which in turn interacts with its receptors uh, on the base of the uh, flagellar rotary motor and biases the direction of the rotation of the motor ultimately determining whether a bacterium is going to run and continue running in the direction that, that it's going in or to stop and tumble and randomly choose a new direction. So what I'm initially going to be interested in is, uh, is uh, this generic task of measuring the concentration of, of a signal um, by biological receptors, either extracellular or intracellular receptors, which 
is, is, uh, is, as I said, you know, ubiquitous in the cellular circuitry. It's a common node in the cellular uh, integrated chip diagram. And what we'd like to understand is how reliably can this be carried out given inherent sources of noise. Time permitting, I'm going to zoom out and take a systems level view of this uh, biochemical network and ask what can we learn about the computations that the signaling module performs um, on the uh, uh, input to generate an output by putting in uh, input signals with known statistics and observing the output. So uh, a quick uh, discussion about the phenomenology of, of chemotaxis in, in bacteria with um, E. coli being, uh, being um, the, the standard um, uh, cell type that um, uh, uh, apparently all cell biologists um, have two cells of interest, either E. coli, E. coli and whatever particular other species they're, they're working on. But uh, again, uh, E. coli is, is, uh, is, has, has been a, uh, used in the lab um, extensively and a lot is known about its, its genetics and therefore the chemotaxis signaling module that we'll focus on is, is based on uh, what we know in E. In e. coli. Um, what, uh, what the chemotactic response involves, as I said, is the measuring of a fluctuating input concentration, food or repellent. Um, the cell, the signaling network, performs a computation on that input, which involves a prediction of the current state of the cell, the current concentration that the, uh, at the present location of the cell, and, and the cell's uh, uh, forecast prediction of the future state of the environment, uh, and, and this is done through um, performing essentially um, a uh, time derivative filtering um, operation on the input. And ultimately, the response is the modulation of the mean runtime, as I said. So uh, in the case of E. coli, fluorescently stained here, there are something like four to eight um, flagella per cell. They uh, are able to uh, bundle into a single propeller when they all rotate in a particular direction. Turns out to be in the counterclockwise direction. This is the direction that matches the inherent chirality of the flagellar filament when they rotate in the counterclockwise direction. Hydrodynamic coupling between uh, flagella allowed them to bundle up and act as a propeller, and the cell runs. Um, uh, if one or more flagella rotate in the opposite direction, the bundle hydrodynamically falls apart. The cell very immediately in the low Reynolds number regime that single-celled organisms inhabit stops, uh, tumbles, and selects a new direction, which may or may not be better than the direction it was going in. And at the end of the day, by modulating the mean runtime, it's able to exhibit um, a biased random walk in the direction that it wants to go. So as, as I said, the measurement of the concentration of signaling molecules by receptors is a generic task in the cellular circuitry. In, in the case of chemotaxis, it's, uh, it's really the name of the game. Measure concentration of food and find greener pastures. But um, it's, it's an example of, 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 um, of a measurement process that goes on um, at uh, various, um, at, uh, various uh, uh, junctures in the cell, beginning with, for example, the expression of, of genes where a region on the DNA um, to which a transcription factor, a protein molecule that determines whether or not a gene is going to be expressed uh, uh, binds, this region of DNA can be thought of as a receptor or sensor for the binding of the transcription factor. 
and that uh, in turn controls um, the expression of the uh, protein product of that gene. This uh, process we can think of as a, as, a, as a measurement process where the sensor measures the concentration of, of a signal and determines whether the next steps should happen. So it's a generic task and what we'd like to understand is what the physical limit is in this measurement accuracy. Do biological systems um, at the level of you know, individual receptors or um, whole cells come close to this limit? And uh, how does this limit in turn constrain downstream events? This question was first posed uh, in a now classic paper by Howard Berg and Ed Purcell entitled The Physics of Chemoreception. And in that paper, they show that the measurement of chemoattractant concentration by single-celled organisms is limited by statistical fluctuation, fluctuations and that the least fractional error attainable is set by the physics of diffusion and that the E. coli chemotaxis machinery is nearly optimal, meaning that it comes close to uh, the uh, limit of, 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 uh, of uh, counting uh, uh, numbers of uh, diffusing signaling molecules. So I already said what the title, what the outline of the talk is going to be. I'm going to uh, look at the limits of biochemical signaling by individual receptors and and groups of cooperatively interacting receptors and time permitting, look at this, uh, the uh, systems level uh, view of, of uh, the chemotaxis network from the standpoint of, of um, information processing. So uh, first, a quick um, review of uh, Berg and Purcell's approach. They start by considering a hypothetical perfect concentration measuring device, okay? And this is basically a device that's able to count the number of diffusing signaling <coughs> molecules within, uh, within uh, uh, an effective volume that's set by its characteristic linear dimension um, exactly, okay? And so if the mean concentration of the signal is C bar and the size of this, um, device linear dimension is A, the mean number of, of particles uh, that it would, uh, signaling molecules that it would count in one measurement is C bar times the volume. However, we know that a single measurement is subject to um, a measurement error delta N that goes like the square root of the mean number of, 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 of particles. And uh, we also know from taking measurements in the lab that we can uh, beat down this single measurement error by making multiple measurements. And so if this device is able to integrate the concentration of the, uh, of the signal in time, or in other words, take multiple measurements in some time tau, um, it's able to beat down uh, the measurement error in the following way. Uh, the characteristic diff time scale for diffusion to refresh uh, this, this, this region uh, is dimensionally given by the size of the device squared divided by the diffusion constant, okay? Uh, and this ensures that basically the device is not counting the same molecules over and over again uh, and that each measurement really constitutes uh, an independent sampling of of, of, of the signal. So if it integrates the signal uh, for a length of time tau, tau over the diffusive time scale is the number of independent measurements it can make, and therefore the measurement error goes down by a factor of one over the square root of number of measurements, and that leads to a relative accuracy in measuring the concentration C that is uh, given by this expression and uh, we could have uh, dimensionally arrived uh, at this result as well. Uh, it's uh, given by one over square root of the product of the concentration of the signal, the linear dimension of the device, uh, the diffusion constant, and uh, the measurement time. 
So some questions that arise are how does this argument that's based on counting molecules in a volume work for cells and receptors that count molecules on their surface? Um, how general is it? Does it apply equally well to a single receptor molecule um, uh, as well as to an entire cell? And, and more specifically, uh, how do we go from a single receptor to a cluster of receptors and what about interactions um, between receptors? Finally, what about the biochemical details of the measurement process, which uh, is, is, uh, uh, is involved when we consider a device that's that's in fact not counting molecules perfectly, but rather through the binding and unbinding of, of the signal with, with, the, with the sensor. So um, we revisited um, this problem uh, in the following way. Uh, we consider uh, starting with a sing single receptor and look at specifically at the uh, diffusion of the substrate or signal and its binding uh, and unbinding to the receptor. N is the binding occupancy of, of the receptor. It goes from 0 to 1. 0 is unbound, 1 is bound. Um, these, these rates characterize the rate at which the substrate binds and unbinds from the receptor. There is, uh, there is a, a, a delta function term in the, in the diffusion equation describing the signal that uh, accounts for the fact that a binding event counts as a sink and an unbinding event as a source for uh, diffusion of the substrate at the location of the receptor. Detailed balance relates the ratio of the on and off rates to the difference in the free energy between the bound and unbound states of the receptor. Um, fluctuations uh, in the concentration of the diffusing signal, as well as fluctuations in the uh, difference in free energies of the bound and unbound states of the receptor will uh, drive the uh, the linear response of the uh, steady state solution to the governing equations in the previous uh, slide. So these are the linearized equations. If I look at the linear response of the receptor occupancy uh, to, uh, to uh, fluctuations in concentration and, uh, and fluctuations in the, uh, in the uh, binding free energy, okay, uh, we note that uh, these linearized equations are, are indeed an, an analogous to uh, a mechanical uh, counterpart that we are perhaps more familiar with, namely the Brownian motion of a, of a particle um, uh, 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 under a uh, Hookean restoring force in equilibri equilibrium with a, with a particle bath. In the, in the limit that we can ignore uh, the inertial term. So indeed, what we're doing is inferring the concentration of the signal by monitoring the binding occupancy of, of the receptor. And, uh, and um, um, our, our, uh, our machinery for extracting the um, relative accuracy in this measurement process is the fluctuation dissipation theorem, which uh, relates uh, the fluctuations um, in, in uh, which, which relates the uh, power spectrum of the fluctuations in, in the force on the Brownian particle to the damping constant. And not surprisingly, both uh, um, both uh, the damping and the fluctuations arise from collisions between the Brownian particle and the particle bath. Um, more generally, the uh, fluctuations in some coordinate x can be related to uh, the conjugate force 
through some linearized susceptibility, knowing the linearized susceptibility, which we can extract from um, the linearized um, equations, um, the general form of the fluctuation dissipation theorem relates the power spectrum of the coordinate or uh, equivalently its conjugate force to the imaginary part of the linearized susceptibility. So we can extract um, the susceptibility from the linearized equations and ask what uh, is the accuracy of a measurement which integrates the concentration of the, uh, of the substrate for a time that's long compared to the correlation time of the binding process. Okay? And if we're willing to integrate for a time that's, that's long uh, compared to this uh, time characterized by the characteristic binding and unbinding rates, then, uh, then uh, the variance in the, our measurement of concentration can be related to the zero frequency limit of, 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 of the power spectrum um, and we can, we can um, extract that from the generalized susceptibility. When we do that, we find a relative measurement accuracy that looks like the following. So it has a contribution now from two terms. Um, there is a term that is essentially identical up to a factor to the Berg and, and Purcell result but there is an additional contribution which comes from uh, the measurement error uh, in, in the biochemical process of measuring the, the concentration. However, we note that, that this measurement accuracy is, is still set by this lower bound given by uh, the physics of, of, of diffusion. And, uh, and the chemical measurement process only adds to this noise floor. Additionally, we can ask uh, what happens when we don't have just a single receptor, but uh, rather multiple uh, receptors, perhaps uh, working together to uh, uh, measure the concentration of ligand. And uh, that uh, is also a situation that uh, occurs uh, uh, fairly ubiquitously in the cellular circuitry. Famous example being um, the hemoglobin molecule, which binds for um, oxygen at atoms and, um, and uh, exhibit uh, a very sharp or sigmoidal response in its, in its uh, conformation um, to the concentration of, of the signal. So this is uh, called cooperativity or allostery in, in, in biochemical signaling um, where uh, a macromolecule has, has multiple binding sites and can exist in, in one of a number of states and uh, whether it, it exists in, in one state or another is, uh, is a function of the number of substrate molecules that are bound. This sigmoidal response is also present in uh, the chemotaxis uh, 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 signaling network, where now, if we look at the back end of the network, where the intracellular signal binds to receptors at the base of the flagellar motor and biases its uh, direction of, of rotation, ultimately biasing whether the cell runs or tumbles, we note that the clockwise bias or the counterclockwise bias as a function of, uh, of the concentration of the intracellular signal has this very sharp response. This is the related um, uh, switching frequency, frequency of switching between the two rotational states of, of the motor. Um, there are detailed um, electron microscopy images that tell us how big this receptor cluster um, at the base of the flagellar motor is. It's uh, about 45 nanometers in diameter and consists of about 34 um, individual binding uh, subunits. And so we can now think of this cluster as, uh, as a sensor and ask 
um, how, how well does this cluster uh, do in, in measuring the concentration of, the, of, of, the in, of, of its input. Um, and, uh, 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 and first of all, what, what, what are the theoretical limits? And given these experimental measurements, how close um, uh, does the performance of the cluster come to uh, the, uh, the theoretical bounds? What exactly is the experiment? What, what is being measured actually? Uh -huh. Right. So this is the clockwise bias of the flagellar motor. So this, this you observe. This you observe, right. So what they do is they um, attach the cell to a slide so it's immobilized and they put a, a fluorescent tag on the flagellum and they observe its, its uh, rotation under the microscope, clockwise or counterclockwise. Okay. They find um, what fraction of the time it spends in the clockwise rotational state um, as a function of the intracellular concentration of the signal. How they vary that is, is, a, um, is actually a, a, um, a notable um, uh, experimental feat. Um, but they basically um, are able to uh, uh, vary the concentration of this intracellular signal and how, how do you measure that? So how do you measure that? Um, again, these are proteins that are fluorescently tagged. Okay, so by measuring the fluorescence intensity of these tagged molecules inside the cell, you infer their concentration. Right. So depending on what the concentration of the intracellular signal is, um, the, the mean clockwise bias is going to be different. Okay? So if the concentration is low, um, the flagella are almost entirely always rotating in the, almost always rotating in the counterclockwise direction. If the concentration is, is high, they're almost always in the clockwise state. Okay, so they have, uh, you know, an ex experimental um, uh, way of modulating this co concentration, and I can I can say more about that if people are interested. Um, yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. So. Um, Let's go back to an early slide that went by very quickly. So the idea is that um, uh, as, as cells are exhibiting this chemotactic response, uh, you know, not attached to a, a, a slide in the lab, okay, there is an ex extracellular signal, food, that binds to um, particle detectors on the cell surface. It, it triggers uh, a cascade of reactions inside the cell okay, that culminate in the change in the concentration of, of another chemotaxis molecule. These are you know, very creatively named the B chemotaxis molecule, the R chemotaxis molecule. This is the Y chemotaxis molecule. Okay? And the, its level of phosphorylation changes. Okay? And so the mean uh, concentration of phosphorylated PY uh, inside the cell will determine the motor bias because uh, this uh, PY will bind to receptors on the, at the base of the motor, the ones that uh, we saw in, in uh, this, this slide. Okay, so these are individual um, binding sites, okay, each of these, uh, so this cluster constitutes 34 uh, individual binding sites and essentially acts as, as a receptor cluster. And this binding event, uh, like the hemoglobin example, where the binding of, of oxygen uh, to hemoglobin uh, uh, causes it to change in a very sharp 
sigmoidal fashion um, between its relaxed and tense conformational states, the binding of, of uh, intracellular QIP to the receptors at the base of the flagellar motor causes it to switch between these two rotational states. Is that clearer? Yes, no? Why is the switching the derivative of the moving? Uh, you mean this? Yeah, this is the derivative of the top curve. Is there a simple reason for that? Uh, well, uh, so there is a simple reason. Um, so uh, it's, it's basically in, in, uh, it, it's in, this, in this region of concentration that the clockwise bias is changing rapidly in, in response to the concentration of, of the input, okay? And, and therefore, it's in this range in con concentration that the switching frequency is going to be highest. When the, there is very little QIP or a lot of QIP, okay, you're almost always in the clockwise state or counterclockwise state. It's in this region that you're going to be switching a lot between those two rotational states. So, uh, so this, this constitutes very few QIP molecules bound to the motor, a lot of QIP molecules bound to the motor. In both of these limits, the motor is in one or the other state. It's in, these, in this intermediate concentration region that it switch, switches frequently. Okay, so we can describe this uh, transition between the two states of the flagellar motor corresponding to uh, clockwise and counterclockwise rotating states. Remember, if the, if the flagella are rotating in the counterclockwise state, that is in the same direction as the inherent chi chirality of the flagellar filament, and they bundle and the cell runs. If they rotate in the clockwise direction, the bundle falls apart and the cell tumbles. So whether the motor is in the clockwise or counterclockwise state ultimately determines the, um, the motion or the response of the cell to environmental cues. So there are a number of ways of describing this uh, uh, al allosteric or, or cooperativity in, in uh, receptor clusters. Um, one model is the mono wyman Chandra model, which um, we um, apply to the bacterial flagellar motor. Basically, the uh, free energy of the motor in uh, each of its two states here, labeled relaxed and tense um, after the, the, the hemoglobin um, um, analog, but really referring to clockwise and counterclockwise. The, the free energy uh, depends on the number of, of bound uh, uh, intracellular signaling molecules. There is a dissociation constant that describes the binding of the signal to the motor in, in, in its two states. And this dissociation constant is assumed to be different. Uh, tighter binding of substrate in one state versus, versus the other. We can write down a partition function for the receptor cluster and from it find the probability that the motor is in, in one state or the other given um, N bound signaling molecules. And summing that up, we can find the probability of the motor being in the clockwise or counterclockwise state given a particular concentration of, of signal. We can look at, again, at the coupled switching and substrate diffusion. Um, so uh, this is going on now at individual binding sites. Um, substrate diffusion sources and sinks for the uh, diffusion of the substrate at individual binding sites. Um, and now uh, we have also the dynamics of the cluster switching between uh, the two states where the rates of, of, of switching are uh, uh, also uh, dependent on the substrate concentration. So if we follow through the same 
steps using the fluctuation dissipation theorem, we can find the relative accuracy with which uh, a cluster um, of, of n sites, um, effective size A, uh, uh, individual receptor size B, um, measures the concentration of, of a signal by, again, integrating over a time that's long compared to the characteristic um, uh, char characteristic time scale associated with um, uh, substrate binding and unbinding. Again, we find that there is a lower bound that is independent of the details of the biochemical kinetics. So this is, this is a term that depends only on, on uh, the diffusion constant, the, uh, the concentration of the signal, um, the number of receptors, uh, and, and uh, geometrical factors that have to do with the cluster size and independent um, uh, receptor size. There is a constant that also arises from, um, from uh, uh, detailed consideration of the distribution of, of, of uh, receptors on the cluster. Um, so what we note is, um, in addition to the fact that there, this, this diffusive lower bound persists, what we note is that the contribution from the chemical measurement error now has this uh, factor of, of one over the number of receptors squared, um, which uh, essentially allows uh, this chemical measuring device to beat down the measurement error by increasing the number of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of sensors uh, perhaps approaching the, 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 the uh, diffusive uh, lower bound. And so what we'd like to understand is um, using the data from uh, the response of the flagellar motor to the change in concentration of the intracellular signal, um, what is the relative um, magnitude of each of these two terms? Does the chemical measurement error, for example, trump the diffusive lower bound, or um, are, they, are they comparable? And so um, that's uh, shown here. So in detail, um, the, there are two curves. Okay, The dotted uh, curves correspond to uh, the diffusive lower bound um, using two typical values of the diffusion constant of of proteins inside the cell extracted from experimental measurements, not of this particular protein molecule, but um, of, of other protein molecules inside the cell. And so we use two representative values. So we can plot this diffusive lower bound as a function of concentration of intracellular signal for, um, for D um, larger and D smaller uh, diffusion constant. Okay. We can also um, recast the, uh, the first term, the measurement error, in terms of, um, in terms of uh, uh, quantities that are experimentally measured, namely the switching frequency. Okay. And the, uh, these, uh, these terms correspond to the, the, the mean receptor occupancy, single receptor occupancy, in the two states of, of, of the motor, clockwise and counterclockwise. So what we can do using the switching data, okay, is to plot the first term in two ways, okay? First, um, I will assume that this term uh, is the largest it can be, okay, giving the smallest bound. And the largest it can be is one. That assumes that, um, that the signal binds very tightly um, to one state and not at all to the other state of the motor. Okay? And that gives this lower bound of the experimental data shown in, in circles. Okay? Another way of, of, uh, of finding this, this uh, first term is in addition to the switching frequency, we can, we can use the data that gives the clockwise bias as a function of concentration to actually calculate the dissociation constant in, 
the two states um, in, in the two states from, from fits to the um, bias data. And, uh, and that gives us uh, the squares, okay? So the take home message is that the, the data interpreted in one of two, two ways, okay? This is the, uh, the lowest bound that the data would offer, and this is the lowest bound that the uh, diffusive limit would, would offer using typical values of diffusion constants. These are comparable. And in general, if I interpret the data um, slightly differently by using you know, actual fits to the clockwise bias as well, I get, uh, I get uh, uh, a bound that's, that's different by a factor of a few. But at the end of the day, the measurement, the biochemical measurement error that comes from treating the motor as a cooperative receptor cluster is comparable to the lower bounds set by, um, by diffusion. So that's basically the take home message that the physical limit to biochemical signaling that was first suggested by Bergen Purcell as coming from diffusive counting noise is surprisingly general. Um, chemical processing of the measurement of the con concentration um, simply adds to this, um, to this uh, uh, lower bound. Uh, cooperativity, which is a ubiquitous property of, of receptor clusters, can serve to bring down this um, contribution allowing signaling systems to approach the diffusive lower bound. And, and a theme that can be made um, increasingly quantitative by, uh, by um, uh, essentially uh, comparing with quantitative ex experiments is that for crucial tasks and for bacteria, there's a huge selective pressure to uh, find food quickly. For crucial tasks, uh, measurement of concentration really does approach the limit set by physical laws. And there are, uh, there are works, um, examples are given here, but there's a, a, a very extensive um, um, past and present literature uh, uh, in, in these areas as well as others, demonstrating, for example, the, preci the precision of of uh, gene expression boundaries in development, um, which essentially comes down to counting numbers of, of transcription factors and accordingly turning on um, uh, uh, genes, as well as um, the chemotactic response of the growth cone in neurons that uh, controls um, the precise wiring of, of of uh, nerve cells in, in the nervous system. So um, although we focused on, on, on bacteria as the so-called hydrogen atoms, um, uh, there are, um, uh, uh, there are um, other um, uh, important examples that uh, show the same um, um, performance consistent with physical lower bounds. They don't look for food, they look for a chemical signal, for example, neurotransmitters secreted by other nerve cells. So this uh, is uh, meant to uh, uh, illustrate a, a schematic of a concentration gradient of a chemical signal. That's not food, but it's a signal that uh, receptors uh, on the growth cone respond to and grow preferentially in that direction because that's the direction in which they're going to go to make a connection, a contact with another neuron. So this is another neuron here and this guy is going to grow in that direction. But in order to do so, it has to, it has to precisely determine um, what direction to grow in. Yeah, they, they grow and they retract. Um, in, in this case, the, the, there isn't a, a motion uh, or biased random walk as in the case of bacteria, but, uh, but the growth cone essentially uh, probes the, 
local environment by growing and retracting in, uh, in uh, uh, many directions and in, uh, by sampling uh, uh, its local environment uh, uh, through this uh, growth and, 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 and retraction and then choosing the direction in which the concentration gradient is highest. It's, it's not motion, but rather growth and, and retraction that samples the local concentration field. Okay, so I think I have maybe 10, ten minutes. So, uh, I have a yeah. Um, um, you know, insects, of course, follow uh, concentrations of pheromones. Yes, olfaction, olfaction is a. Are, are yeah. Absolutely. There's been a lot of yeah. Right. Yes, yes, yes. So, and in fact, I, uh, I should have put olfaction on there as well, um, but, but you're absolutely right. There are examples known where insects can respond to a single odorant molecule. Um, and so it's, it's the same process of, of, of signaling where, you know, odorant interacts with uh, with receptor, you know, triggering downstream events that ultimately culminate somewhere in the brain in the sense of smell. But the first stage is, is, uh, is the measurement of the concentration of signal by the, by the uh, you know, individual or cluster of receptors. Okay, so in, in this part of the talk, I will quickly zoom out and take uh, a systems level view of the chemotaxis network, essentially treating it as a black box and ask um, if I put in a, a known signal and observe the output, what can I say about the computation that the network performs on the input to produce the output? Um, the chemotaxis network is especially well suited uh, in, this, in this respect because, as I said, it's biochemically very well characterized and, um, and, and therefore, you know, what we learn we can then, you know, extend to lesser characterized uh, networks um, uh, and, and uh, uh, as well as, um, as well as, you know, make quantitative comparisons with, with experiments. So while we consider information processing to be that which is carried out by usually neurons or networks of neurons, um, really the most fundamental uh, level of information processing in biology um, is at the level of of biochemical signaling networks where an internal or external stimulus is measured and converted into a response. In the case of chemotaxis, as we saw, um, it's uh, the uh, uh, number of, of uh, attractant or repellent molecules that uh, triggers a response, uh, a change in uh, the um, rotational state um, of, of, of the motor. Um, it, this is directly analogous to um, uh, 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 a, a very similar problem in, in neuroscience, uh, namely visual transduction, where uh, photons interacting with photoreceptor cells, the first stage in, in the visual transduction pathway, um, generate uh, what uh, is uh, eventually, uh, uh, what, what eventually becomes a change in the uh, potential between the inside and outside of the cell, a change in transmembrane potential, otherwise known as uh, a neuronal spike. So change in concentration of, of molecules gives rise to a change in motor bias, in visual transduction, um, the change in, in, in number of, of, of photons gives rise to uh, the uh, uh, change in the transmembrane potential or spike, which in turn uh, uh, it, uh, is 
is uh, transmitted by, by other neurons and uh, culminates in, some, uh, in, in the sense of, of vision in some region in the brain. Okay, so, um, so really these, these two problems are, are very analogous and the techniques that I'm going to use to think about um, chemotaxis as a signaling module, uh, as a black box, are borrowed directly from, from, uh, from computational neuroscience, from looking at how uh, networks of neurons um, perform computations on their input to produce an output. And as I said, what's uh, nice about the chemotaxis network is that we have a complete characterization of the, uh, the proteins, their numbers, um, their reactions and, and, and reaction rates, and therefore we can simulate the chemotaxis network um, in a way that fairly realistically represents the actual experimental system and um, the work that, um, that we've carried out is based on uh, there are a number of, of computational frameworks and we've, we've used and adapted one of them. So what do we do? Um, in response, we, we put in a fluctuating uh, concentration of, of attractant um, and uh, we, we simulate the, the uh, network response to this um, input. Um, for example, uh, here is the concentration of the intracellular QIP. This is the one that, that interacts with the motor and biases its rotational state. And we adopt uh, a phenomenological model for the change in the state of the motor that's based on a simple threshold crossing when the concentration of this internal signal crosses uh, this threshold, the motor switches from one, one state to another. And again, we've borrowed this from, from previous works. We can show, and these are our simulation results, that the, uh, that the uh, statistics of the motor reversals produced um, in our simulation, put in input, let the network do its thing, um, phenomenologically model the motor response, look at the fraction of the time the motor spends in the clockwise and counterclockwise states. Um, we, we find these distributions in our simulations that, that, uh, um, that well represent the experimental data. And so at the end of the day, what we're going to do um, having made this comparison is essentially use the simulations as a proxy for experiments. And we put in uh, a single a signal uh, which uh, is Gaussian, a Gaussian distributed time series with specified uh, mean and, and standard deviation and correlation time and we observe motor reversal events. Note that um, unlike the neuronal case where uh, there is one class of, of, of output events, spikes, uh, corresponding to a change in the rapid change in the transmembrane potential. We have two classes of, of spikes, um, transitions from counterclockwise to clockwise and clockwise to counterclockwise states. So what we can do is the following. What we're interested in is is to plot uh, the so-called input-output relations for the, this uh, sensory network um, where the output is the motor reversal rate and the input is the concentration of the input signal that we're putting in. Okay? If the input signal is slow, then, uh, then the network can essentially track uh, the changes in the input signal. And what I mean by slow is slow compared to the characteristic time scales of, 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 of the chemotaxis network given by, um, by the network reaction rate. And so you can see you know, the input signal and the output reversal rate and, their, and, and the output pretty much tracks the input and we can plot 
um, uh, input-output relations in this way by, by essentially taking directly plotting the reversal rate as a function of the input concentration. <coughs> in the case where the input signal is a fast signal, meaning that, um, that uh, the correlation time is faster than the characteristic um, time scale of, of, uh, of, uh, of the network, um, then uh, we have to work harder to extract the input-output relations, and we use a technique, as I said, borrowed from, comp uh, from computational neuroscience, which is a reverse correlation method called spike-triggered, or in our case, motor reversal-triggered covariance analysis. Okay? In, in, in the case of a rapidly varying signal, the, uh, the network can't track the changes in the input stimulus, and instead the output, the reversal events, depend on the history of, of the input over some, some window. And um, the technique that we use to extract um, output reversal rate as a function of, of input relies on um, figuring out how the two distributions, the distribution of uh, the raw stimulus and the distribution of the stimulus um, given, uh, given uh, motor reversal events, okay, differ. So that's done by essentially looking at um, constructing two covariance matrices. One is that of the raw stimulus, and that's, that's the prior. And um, a second covariance matrix, which is the covariance matrix of the input stimu stimulus, um, the, 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 the output triggered, motor reversal triggered input stimulus, essentially, essentially using you know, these pieces of the input stimulus to uh, construct um, the covariance matrix. Okay. If we construct the difference between these two covariance matrices, all right, and look at the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of, of this matrix, we find the following. There's a background of zero eigenvalues that correspond to um, directions in stimulus space, where uh, the distribution of the raw input stimulus and the motor reversal triggered input stimulus are the same. Well, specifically, the variances are the same. Okay? There are uh, a few uh, eigenvalues that pop out of this zero background, and these eigenvalues um, if, if, if correspond to directions, again, where um, the uh, two distributions uh, don't have uh, the same variance. And we can, we can look at these eigenvectors, and not surprisingly, they correspond to um, uh, an averaging and a differentiating um, operation. So the first eigenvalue corresponds to uh, an averaging filter that computes the average concentration of the input signal, and the second eigenvector corresponds to a differentiating filter that finds the time derivative of, um, of, the, uh, um, of, of the concentration. And that's essentially what the chemotaxis response is about. Uh, find the concentration and, and determine whether it's increasing or decreasing in time. So we can, we can um, use these um, eigenvectors or um, filters to uh, find um, the filtered uh, signal, and, and from, from the filtered signal, construct um, input-output relations as a function of the signal filtered along uh, these dominant directions. Um, so this is the average uh, signal, and this is the time derivative and we construct input-output relations from conditional probability distributions um, of, of the um, um, input 
um, of, of, the, of the output triggered input and, and the raw stimulus. So this is, these are the probability distributions that we find. And uh, from them, we can construct um, input-output relations and ask, well, how well do um, these two network, network filters or uh, 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 input-output relations computed by essentially reducing the function of the chemotaxis network to these two operations, averaging and, and differentiating, how, how well does this capture the response of the network? We can put in an input stimulus, um, filter it, use the computed input-output relation to find uh, the reversal rate based on these two dominant filters only. Um, that's shown in, um, in blue. Uh, and in red, we have the actual um, out output of, of the network. And here they are superimposed, demonstrating that these two dominant filters indeed do fairly accurately capture the, the response of this, um, of this network. Um, we can plot the input-output relations for slow signals as well as fast signals for signals that have different means but the same coefficient of variation. Um, and uh, we note that if we subtract the mean and rescale by the variance of, of uh, the, sorry, the standard deviation of the input signal that these uh, different input-output relations collapse onto a universal function, both for the slow signal as well as shown here for the fast signal. Um, and we can um, ask, well, what is the purpose of this, of this rescaling, uh, this response of the network to the statistics of the input stimulus, um, essentially demonstrating that for a given coefficient of variation, uh, regardless of what the mean is, the response is, is essentially the same. So we use uh, the mutual information to, uh, uh, to uh, essentially further quantify the statistical dependency between the output and input. Mutual information basically tells us what we learn about one variable, one random variable, say the output of the chemotaxis network by observing um, the input or equivalently, how much our uncertainty about one variable is, is, uh, is reduced when we uh, learn uh, about uh, uh, another variable. So we can go ahead and compute the mutual information between the output of the, net of the chemotaxis network and, and, and the input for um, for signals with uh, different coefficients of variation. And uh, we note that, uh, indeed, when there is larger variability in the signal, larger signal over mu, uh, the signal has a greater information content. Um, and that signals that have the same coefficient of variation, for example, blue, green, and red, in the most sensitive region of the chemotaxis receptors, uh, transmit essentially the same amount of, of, uh, of information. We can find directly also the information transmitted um, by the network by computing it directly from the output signal as opposed to the filtered output and construct the ratio of the information um, direct, directly calculated and that um, uh, uh, from that calculated using um, the dominant network filters. And we can show that, indeed, the network filters um, uh, for, uh, for the larger coefficients of variation transmit um, a, um, a, a large fraction, more than 80 percent, of the, of the information um, um, uh, information carried by the input signal. So I'm going to put this final slide up um, and maybe uh, acknowledge my collaborators on, um, on the various parts of this project as well as 
collaborators on you know, other projects um, and take any other questions. Sorry for running over. setting. So one common um, assay that's used to study chemotaxis are so-called auger assays where um, uh, essentially there's a petri dish that's loaded with um, an uh, agarose gel. Um, it's a fluid-filled porous medium that is loaded with nutrients. Cells are inoculated in the middle and then they basically grow they divide, but also move because they deplete the nutrients where they are and thereby establish a concentration gradient um, that increases uh, in, in the radial direction. So, uh, so those are the standard assays. And, and, uh, and in, in that case, you know, the cells are growing and, and dividing, but they're also moving in response to the, um, the concentration gradient that they see. And, uh, and you can get, you know, a number of, of different um, uh, uh, regimes in, 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 in these auger assays of the, you know, density of, of cells as a function of, of, of radius. Um, essentially, they, you know, they produce metabolites that are, uh, act as repellents for other cells. Um, so then they're not only responding to the attractant gradient, but they're resp responding also to uh, a gradient of repellents produced by others. But by and large, in these chemotaxis assays, they're not competing with each other in the sense of producing um, bacterial toxins, for example, that you know, kill off other cells so that you know, they're the only ones um, surfing the concentration gradient. Um, there are, you know, other, other um, sort of experimental evolution assays that people have, you know, performed where they essentially ask, um, you know, how are the concentrations of chemotaxis proteins optimized, you know, in a given, in a given environment? You know, why are there, you know, 10,000 QIT molecules and not 5,000? And so you can do these you know, evolution assays and, and similar petri dish assays and, you know, ask, um, you know, how does the net chemotaxis network evolve uh, given particular environmental conditions? But, but that's a very good question because, you know, evolution is, a, is, is, a, is an excellent um, uh, optimization vehicle and, um, and it often does uh, over time um, you know, change various um, uh, aspects of bacterial strategy to make it better. Uh, I want to understand better how your in coli is able to achieve the uh, physical limit. Mm -hmm. You mean your, your E. coli must be making measurements uh, on a much faster time scale or, or over many shorter length scales than mm -hmm. the observation. So uh, I want to know, do we, do we understand this shorter time scale or shorter length scale from these experiments? Um. So if I understand your question correctly, um, so 
you're, you're, you're wondering <laughs> about the time scale of Let's the. Say, I have a partial moving yeah. in a fluid. Yes. And it's diffusing. Right. But Right. Then the then the cell speed, you mean? Yes. yes. So there has to be some much faster or many more measurements being made than just cutting a pack. There has to be many different measurements to be made in order to achieve the diffusion equation. Right. Right, so that's a good question, and I can defer to the fact that I'm a theorist, so I, perhaps, I don't know, but um, we can also think about having a stationary cell, okay? So the cell doesn't have to be moving, although that's the natural setting. It's moving and measuring, okay? Um, but we can also think of the cell being stationary and and, and, and there being a concentration field, right? Um, you know, a, a gradient that, that it's, um, it's still responding to if we can, we can, we can monitor the, the, the rotational bias of, of the motor and therefore its response, but it doesn't have to be moving, right? So we can, we can remove the cell motion from the measurement process. Although, as you point out, what it's doing is moving and measuring at the same time. Um, what I thought you, you were asking was um, this, uh, uh, this point that I made about the measurement time being longer than the characteristic time scale associated with the binding and unbinding of, of, the, of the ligand to the receptors. Um, so that's the short time, that's the short time scale. That's right. It's, it's that binding and unbinding that's the short time scale. That's right. And so as long as it's integrating over a time scale that's long compared to that, and that comes from the binding and unbinding rate. Okay. So as long as it's integrating over a time that's long compared to that, then, um, then we can do everything that we did, look at the zero it's frequency. It's at the surface, yeah. It's at the surface for the detection of the external stimulus. For the uh, internal um, receptors at the base of the motor, it's inside the cell, and that's, that has its own complicating factors. But, um, but uh, uh, typically, the time scale for integration that's, uh, that's um, quoted in bacterial chemotaxis assays is about one second, okay? So the mean runtime, if the cells are not in a gradient, okay, and they're exhibiting a bias, uh, an unbiased random walk, um, their mean runtime is about a second. And uh, that also happens to be the time scale um, uh, over which rotational diffusion will naturally um, um, uh, disorient the bacterial cell from a direction in which it's, it's running. So if the cell integrates over a time scale that's much longer than a second, then um, it will not be going in the direction that it thinks it was going in because rotational diffusion has, has um, changed its orientation. So, um, so, so, the integration time is about a second in the absence of a gradient. When it's going up a gradient, of course, it extends that. And, and it happens to be on the same order of magnitude as the time scale for rotational diffusion to, to um, basically change the um, uh, run direction. 